Good morning to everyone. How very nice to be with you again. <clears throat> My voice is lowered an octave, but otherwise I'm just fine. <laughs> I, I managed to bring a change of weather sniffle with me, but it seems to be uh, vacating the premises very nicely. So I think I'll just sound a little different, but I feel just the same. Our topic today is how to know God's will which we've been talking about in one form or another for quite a while, including about two hours of it last week. But it, it, it seems to be an endless topic that we're always all working with, because, of course, that's the whole premise of our spiritual life, is that we're trying to shift our essential motivation from self-interest to self-interest, capital S, small s. And even more than that, we're trying to shift our very definition of who we are from this limited habit, this habit of limitation to the truth of infinity. Is this a simple project? No. Is this going to be accomplished in a couple of minutes? No. Am I really going to be able to tell you very much? No, not very much. <laughs> but the whole point of coming together even to discuss this idea is the fact that it is a very long and a very big project. I mean, really, we're talking about God's will. We're not talking about sort of being in tune with the latest fashion or even winning the lottery or anything like that. We're talking about shifting our consciousness to infinity. We're talking about living according to the reason why we were born. And I do think a great deal of difficulty that people um, get into when they contemplate this issue is that we um, don't really understand in many ways the magnitude of what we're trying to do and on the other side of it paradoxically the simplicity of what we're trying to do. God's will for us is really exceedingly <coughs> simple. He wants us to be happy. The problem is in the definition of that word happy. When we think of happy, when the ego-based, limited self thinks of happy, happy to us means no challenges, no difficulty, no discomfort, no betrayal, no disappointment, no heartbreak, lots of money, lots of good food, beautiful home, maybe by the sea, maybe in the mountains, maybe two homes, one in the mountain, one by the sea. <laughs> you know, we want to look like the magazine pictures or whatever is popular at the moment. We don't want to have this nose. We want that nose. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it goes on and on, doesn't it? It's just an endless list of who we're trying to be. When I was quite young, I developed the need to wear glasses. Everybody in my family wore glasses, and we were all avid readers. Maybe that's the reason. Um, but being a girl, I was also a little conscious of the fact that I wanted to be pretty. And these big glasses that I had to wear because I couldn't see anything in my own mind seemed to contradict uh, my capacity to be pretty. It was a bit of a problem for me. So I often opted not to be able to see, and I really could see very badly, rather than wearing my glasses because I thought people would like me better. And then one day, and I believe I was in the fourth grade, so it was pretty young, the four, I would have been then nine years old, I looked over at this girl, I still remember her name, she was called Missy Rate. I don't know why the name stays in my mind, but it was such an important moment. And Missy Rate wore glasses. And she was beautiful when she had her glasses on, and she was beautiful when she had her glasses off. And this horrible realization came to me that merely taking off my glasses would not make me beautiful if I wasn't beautiful. So I picked up my glasses and I put them on and I wore them for the next 30 years so that I could see until they invented LASIK surgery. And then I got to take them off again. But it was such a significant moment, even though it seems trivial, that I can still see my classroom, I can still see her, I remember what her glasses frames looked like, and I still remember her name, because it was part of that delusion that we all carry, that I would be happier if. And if I just tinker a little <coughs> bit with these circumstances, somehow these 
uh, nameless anxieties and insecurities that I have will somehow be solved. And uh, what actually happened when I put my glasses on, and I was a skinny little sort of not notable kid in any way, is that I started developing a sense of humor. Because if I didn't have a personality, nobody was going to ever notice me. And as a consequence, perhaps this whole profession came out of the fact that I was skinny and small and not, had to wear glasses and wasn't particularly attractive. So I had to make use of whatever was left to me, which was words and wit and personality and so on. It's all just this crazy mishmash, isn't it? And even as children, it's just the same. Children act out the same impulses in a very different arena. But our whole consciousness is present from the time that we're born. Um, I've never I've been pregnant, I've never born a child, but many women tell me that from the moment of conception, you, you have somebody with you. And that somebody is quite different depending on which child it is. And that personality and that self is really there. We are, Swamiji put it really beautifully when he said, a mother and a father together create the physical vehicle for a soul to express its destiny. But the mother and the father do not create the soul, nor do they create the destiny of the soul. They merely provide an opportunity for that soul to have whatever experience it requires. All of this is designed by the divine for whatever reason and by whatever means that all of us are on this single journey. And it's a very peculiar journey from a human point of view because we have such a difficult time, much of the time, understanding which way is forward, why we are here, and even what success looks like. It's very peculiar, isn't it? God's will for us is very simple. He wants us to know that we are loved. He wants us to rejoice in the fact that we are loved. He wants us eagerly and happily and generously to share that good news with everyone, not by preaching to them, but by being an instrument of that love. The problem is, the difficulty is, that we don't understand that we are loved. And so we spend tremendous amount of our time and energy trying to fill the void that can only be filled by our awareness of God's love with numerous other things, such as being a pretty little eight-year-old who doesn't wear glasses. Why does it matter to me? I had lovely parents. I was completely loved in the world. But moving out into my school classroom, suddenly I felt somehow inadequate. And I began to reach for anything I could imagine that would make me feel less inadequate. And in, after I gave up on being beautiful, I decided to be witty. And you know, and maybe that would help because then I would be loved then I would be noticed. And all the while that we're running around doing that, and everybody has their own long list of what they're doing, Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, God and Guru, however you want to think about it, is inundating us with love, filling us with more love than we can ever imagine is even possible but we're so busy everywhere else that we don't know. And then we had come to the spiritual path because it's occurred to us that maybe something else is going on and we begin to seek what that is and we get this idea that we should follow God's will, which is a very good idea because it occurs to us, probably, that we're not doing so well on our own. You know, maybe we have one of those houses you know, maybe we have a relationship or a family or a little bit of money, or maybe we don't. But one way or another, it occurs to us that it's not really working for me in the way that I hoped it works, would work. And that doesn't mean that we're absolutely miserable. Sometimes people come to the spiritual path 
out of misery. As Ramakrishna would say, there was a, a disciple of his who would come. When things were going well, he would come and he would be very happy about all of God's blessings. When things were going badly, the disciple would come and announce to Ramakrishna that he wanted to be a renunciate. <laughs> and Ramakrishna would say, it is not you who are renouncing the world, it is the world that has renounced you. <laughs> so some of us come to the spiritual path because the world has renounced us. And we feel so alone that we're searching somewhere where we can belong. And this is also part of God's plan because sooner or later, in one way or another, the world will renounce us. And oddly, it doesn't necessarily renounce us with pain. Sometimes it renounces us with fulfillment. And there's, it's an odd fact, statistical fact, that there is more suicide among well-to-do people than there is among impoverished people. Those who lack can always imagine if I only had this, then I would be happy. And so there is this constant, it's not really that, my, that life itself is unfulfilling, it's that I'm only missing this. So I'll just keep trying to get this. And then after many incarnations, we finally get this, whatever it might be. And it pleases us. It's not that the things of this world are horrible. There's many lovely things in this world, human love among them. You know, motherhood, uh, romantic love, friendship, the beauty of, of creation. There's countless beautiful things in this world, but all of them are a shadow compared to what the heart is really longing for. God made us for himself, is how St. Augustine put it. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And God's will for us is that we find our rest in him. And that doesn't mean that the countless other drives and desires that get us up in the morning and force us into action and all the responsibilities with all their chaotic permutations that life imposes upon us. We're born into families. We have to work out all those relationships. Some of those relationships are uplifting, some of them are terribly problematic. Master said we're drawn together by our love for each other, but our aversion to one another is also a very strong magnet. Master said many times enemies incarnate in the same family so they can fight it out at close quarters, is how he put that. Isn't that horrible? I just, it's just so gruesome to have him say that. But we have this romantic idea, you know, of how it's supposed to be. And God has one wish for us. He wants us to understand how much we are loved. So it seems paradoxical that he would put us in situations where we're not loved at all, or where love is so difficult to attain, or even when that love is given to us, our hearts remain empty. But this is the divine drama. This is the lila, as they call it. <clears throat> the only compensating factor is the closer one gets to the fulfillment we're seeking, the more we realize that it's all worth it and that there was no other way to get here. So what God really wants from us is he wants us to trust that whatever happening, whoever is happening, is according to his will. Now that's a very big challenge, isn't it? The other thing that we have to really get into and really try to understand is uh, much of what confuses us about God's will is the fact of time. Time is such an interesting cycle to live through. Most of the way, I'm, I'm going to give you a picture of time and help us to understand how confusing this is. This is a little diagram that I love to draw, but it's so simple you can see it without a, a picture. Just imagine, like, let's say, a bicycle wheel that's just round like this. And in the center, there's uh, the, the gear shift or whatever it is that en enables us to live like this. There are all these different spokes also. Time is a circle, you know, past, present, future like this. And most of us identify and live 
right wherever we are right now. You know, we may have vague uh, or even very clear intuitive memories of lives that we've lived before. We might even have an intuitive idea of where we're going to go next, or we may have such a strong desire to go there. I actually, now that I think about this, this was a picture I saw in the newspaper of a Bollywood star, except I saw the, saw the picture in California. And she was so, the body she had made was so perfect for being a Bollywood star. It was just like stunning to me. I had no idea who she was because this was a long time ago when I saw it. But I remember looking at that picture and thinking, my goodness, how many lifetimes did she concentrate on being a Bollywood star until she worked her body into exactly what she wanted? It was just so magnificent and I thought, I hope it works for her. <laughs> you know, I hope she finds whatever it is she's trying to find because Clearly, God loves her more than Bollywood would ever love her. <laughs> but if she didn't know that, how would she find out? So we live wherever we are. I hope, I don't know how many of you are Bollywood stars. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot where I'm standing. You know, I'm in the place, right? <laughs> we live right on the dot of the outer ring, wherever we are. That's what our life is. And the more deeply we're identified with that life, the more we forget <clears throat> that there's karmic conditions that brought me to this moment, that what I am doing right now by my response to my conditions is setting the conditions for my future. If all we think about is right now, why is this happening to me? Oh, I wish it weren't happening to me. If only it were easier. I wish I didn't have to wear glasses so I could be pretty all the time, you know. Just all these different thoughts that we have with no thought of the past <coughs> that brought us here, no thought of the future that we're making, all we know about time is right now. And we're not living in the moment, we're living for the moment, which is quite different. We have no idea what's really happening. In the center is super consciousness. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a comment that Swami Kriyananda made, which was very interesting. When he was a child, he, his con he was born with such an elevated state of consciousness, he said, and until about the age of nine, he said he lived more in the astral world than into this, in this world. At the age of nine, he became aware of the fact that he lived in a world that no one else shared. And primarily his father did not share his world, and his father was the image to him of what a man would become. It wasn't, his father was a wonderful father, but he was a scientist, he wasn't a philosopher. As Swami writes himself, he said, I, Swamiji says, that he instinctively asked why. His father, who was a scientist and an engineer, instinctively asked how. And Swami really didn't care how, he wanted to know why. And his father was an engineer and he loved his life and he was in Europe digging oil wells for Standard Oil Company and he was a very happy man but they, they didn't match. And Swamiji saw that his father, that he, his father seemed to represent what life was supposed to be, and Swami was so far from it, he began to doubt himself. Simultaneously, he became very ill and delirious with the fever, which, as he said, when he recovered from it, it made him um, be anxious about any altered state of consciousness. That's how he put it. So from the age of nine until he met Master at 22, he tried very hard to fit into the world. But prior to the age of nine, Swami said he just, he just lived more in the astral world. And when he was small, and presumably close all the way till that age, yes, actually all till that age, the way he would fall asleep at night is that he would see a great light form <coughs> in front of him, and he would, ex uh, he would uh, concentrate onto the light until that light absorbed him. And that's how he would go to sleep, or what he thought was sleep. He said he didn't realize that everybody <coughs> didn't do that. Because how would you know? You're a child. That's what he did. So then Swami had this interim period where he resisted a lot of these impulses. This is the lila that all souls are put, put through. And then he when he met Master and learned to meditate and started doing Kriya, as he put it, he said he, he went back into the same super-conscious state 
that he had gone into so easily as a child. And then this was the interesting part for this discussion. He said, and in that state, no time had passed because there is no time in superconsciousness. Isn't that interesting? So he'd been absent, he thought, but when he went back, he was right in the, he said he was in the same moment. He was in the same moment that he'd lived in his childhood, even though all this time had seemingly passed. So with the wheel like this of time and us clinging to some little molecule over here, which we think of as ourself and now, super consciousness in the center, from the superconscious position, you see past, future, present, everything is equidistant, isn't it? There, you can stand in that center point and you can revolve and everything is equally accessible. If you think of the bicycle wheel, the spokes go out equally from there and touch all parts, don't they? Now, what we have to realize, it's not absolute either or, because the, the more we move towards superconsciousness, if you think about it, then we have a triangle that, that gives us a perspective on the rim. Can you, see, can you follow what I'm saying? And so then we begin to understand that, oh, there is the present moment, but there's also what brought us to this present moment, and there's also where we're going to be after this present moment. And this is when we begin to think about simple things like cause and effect. I was so amazed, uh, I lived, when I first moved into this little apartment, which eventually became our community, there were a lot of people living there who were not very compatible with our way of life, and we gradually shifted the residence until we, we had an Ananda community in those same buildings. But when, very early, when there were other people there who didn't have any idea of our philosophy, very early, like at 6.30, on the only, on, on Saturday morning, which in America is a day off from work, the day when people sleep late, a man parked his car right outside my, um, my bedroom window, turned on his radio really loud and began to repair his engine. He was literally feet from where I was sleeping, it was completely loud. Now, America's much quieter than India. I realize that India's noisy like this all the time. But it was very quiet there, and for somebody to do something like that was extremely strange. But I realized this man simply didn't know that anyone else was there. <laughs> he was living so completely in his own reality that that's what he wanted to do and that's simply what he did. And of course then, when people would treat him as if he wasn't there, and as if he had no needs and no reality, he would be furious. Because he would have no sense of what he had done that might have created that. So what God does for us is we start out having no idea where anything is coming from. But as we gradually get life experience, and as we look more toward the center, as all of us in this room would be doing, we move toward that center, and our sense of past and future um, becomes wider and wider, until when we reach the center, it becomes the whole circumference of it. That's what God, God's will is for us, is that we understand that everything in this world is an interwoven tapestry, that, that it is impossible to cut any piece of it out, it's impossible to cut any single thread, that we are part of a greater reality, we are part of all that is. And the way we begin to experience God's will for us, which is that we know how much we are loved, is when we begin to break the barriers of this tiny self-definition that we live in, that think, I am the only one. You know, <clears throat> I have to speak from my own experience, and I don't want to impose it on all of you. But every ounce of suffering that I've been through, and I've had my share, but I would still consider my life to be effortlessly blessed, but I've had my share. Every ounce of suffering that I've had has been enormously to my benefit for one simple reason, because then when I look at others, I understand what it means to suffer. And where it was possible in my life before to inflict suffering more casually upon other people, whether it was by word, by deed, by inattention, whatever it might be, by lack of sympathy for what they were going through. 
the more I suffer, the less I am able to do that. And what that means, very simply, is I recognize that I am a part of all that is. And that whatever unkindness I have sent out in the past ripples back to me. And whatever unkindness I send out in the present hurts people the same as it hurts me. Now why would that matter? Well, once we know how much God loves us and how sweet that experience is, that's the only experience we want to share with people. Why would we want to share anything else with them? And that doesn't mean that no stern measures are ever required. Because if we look at life, we see that even Divine Mother in her love for us, often she has to deliver very strong medicine, doesn't she? And we see souls all around us who are not going to learn from a kind word. They're only going to learn from a strong um, reaction to whatever it is they're doing. But what we, there's a great deal of difference between a, a mindlessly inflicted, callous indifference to someone's welfare and a love-inspired desire for all of us to find out how much God loves us. So when we ask, what is God's will for me? Which sounds like a very complicated question. He wants us to know that we're loved. He wants us to rejoice in that love. And he wants us to be instruments of that love to all whom we meet. It's not easy, but nor is it complicated. And that's what we have to understand on the spiritual path. The spiritual path is really very, very simple. It's just hard to do. So instead of facing into how hard it is to do, we make it complicated. <laughs> because as long as it's complicated, we can just worry about it. But if we realize how simple it is, we actually have to do it. But that's sadhana. Sadhana isn't just when you sit to meditate. Sadhana is every breath you take, every thought you think, every response we have to life. And either it's a recollection of how much God loves us and how we rejoice in that and how we share it. But when we share it, we share it appropriately, just as Divine Mother does. And the capacity to know what Divine Mother would do is dependent upon how much we've opened our heart. The more deeply we allow her to love us, the more capable we are of loving others as she loves them. With joy, with kindness, with wisdom, with bliss.